Crosby did well in his studies. At the same time, he was a deeply ambivalent student who, lured by popular music siren call, dropped out of his pre-law course at Gonzaga in his senior year to go on the road for the rest of his life, as it turned out. His intellectual half-heartedness forever saved him from pedantry and lent a sense of playfulness to his verbal theatrics. That he was smart and funny on his own terms raised him above the pack. The popular music of Crosby's early career was a very mixed bag, containing both great standards that would endure the test of time and some of the schmaltziest tunes ever written. As Bing approached the peak of his movie success in the 1930s, he would have the power and the good sense to simply command his songwriters to leave out the schmaltz. Early on, though, he had to sing plenty of it. This is where his fabled coolness stood him in good stead. Crosby possessed the unique ability to make a number like Just One More Chance, I've Learned the Meaning of Repentance, Now You're the Jury at My Trial, work by sounding wholehearted and ever so slightly skeptical at the same time. The effect was electric. To women, he sounded romantic, vulnerable, and faintly mysterious. To men, he conveyed emotions without going overboard. He was one of them, a man, not some brilliant teen eunuch. And the seeming casualness of his vocal style made every man feel like he could sing like me. Little Frankie was no exception. But he came by the idea honestly. As it happened, both his parents could also sing. Marty had wooed Dolly by serenading her with an old-fashioned number called You Remind Me of the Girl Who Used to Go to School with Me. For her part, Dolly used to love to gussy herself up on Saturday nights, bounce around to Hoboken's many political meetings, get loaded on beer, and warble when Irish eyes are smiling over and over and over again. No wonder Frankie got up on the piano at the bar. Still, Crosby's influence on him cannot be underestimated. The period of Bing's explosion into the American consciousness, propelled by radio's beginnings as a truly mass phenomenon, precisely coincided with Frank Sinatra's emergence as a sexual being. There he was, alone in his room, just him and his radio, with that voice coming out of it. Talk about masculine role models. Poor grunting Marty couldn't have compared well. Anyone who came of age in the early 1960s, hearing Dylan and the Beatles for the first time, can remember the feeling. There you are with your hormones a boil, and someone is speaking, really speaking, to you. And if that someone who's speaking happens to possess genius, interesting things percolate in your mind. Even in early adolescence, Frank Sinatra's mind was an exceedingly interesting one. He was already aware of something that set him apart from others his age, an inner riot of constantly flowing emotions, happy to sad to miserable to ecstatic to bored, sometimes all within the space of a minute, each shift hanging on the precise character of the daylight, the look of the clouds, a sharp sound in the street, the smell of the page of a comic book. He might have been ashamed of his inner chaos at times. Weren't these kinds of feelings for girls? Or he might have been proud. In any case, he kept this part of himself to himself. As, for now, he kept secret the thrill he felt at the sound of Crosby's voice, couched in the certainty that Bing was speaking to him. In fact, in the case of Crosby and Sinatra, genius was speaking to genius. Though in Sinatra's case, the genius was very much nascent. Frank Sinatra was a slow bloomer, with his feet rooted firmly in the soil of New Jersey. When a Life magazine writer asked him in the early 1970s if he could recall the first time he ever sang in public, Sinatra said, I think it was at some hotel in Elizabeth, New Jersey, late 20s, I probably sang, am I blue? And I probably got paid a couple of packs of cigarettes and maybe a sandwich. Which begs the question of those piano top performances at Marty O'Brien's. But still, he was singing. Unlike school, this was something he could do. In June 1931, he graduated from Hoboken's David E. Rue Junior High School. Around that same time, perhaps as a graduation present, 
his mother, always looking to boost his popularity, bought him a used Chrysler convertible for $35. That fall, she had reason to regret her generosity. After a mere 47 days attendance at A.J. Demarest High, Frankie either dropped out or, as he later claimed, probably in another attempt to bolster his bad boy credentials, was expelled for general rowdiness. He was not quite 16. According to some sources, Dolly, who dreamed of Frankie's becoming a doctor or a civil engineer, was furious. If you think you're going to be a goddamn loafer, you're crazy, she is said to have screamed. According to other accounts, however, Dolly was unperturbed. Her way of thinking, Anise recalled, was that Italians didn't need an education to get a job. Even if Marty's plans for his son to attend Stevens Institute had hit a rough patch. In any case, somebody was disappointed. If Frank Sinatra's boyhood were a movie, a continuing visual theme would have to be Dolly marching around Hoboken, her firm jaw set, bent on accomplishing for the powerless males around her what they seemed unable to accomplish for themselves. This time, she marched straight over to the offices of the Jersey Observer and buttonholed Frankie's godfather and namesake, the Observer circulation manager, Frank Garrick refusing to leave the premises until she had secured for her son a job bundling newspapers on a delivery truck. A famous story ensues. Frankie, restless and smart and intellectually ambitious, though also possessing a strong streak of intellectual laziness, didn't like bundling newspapers on a delivery truck. Instead, he got it into his head that he would prefer to be a sports writer. Not become a sports writer. Be a sports writer. And so one day, after some poor cub reporter on the Observer sports desk got himself killed in a car wreck, Dolly ordered her thoroughly unqualified son to march into Garrick's office and demand the job. Not finding Garrick present, Frankie went over to the dead boy's desk and simply sat down, doing things he imagined an actual sports writer might do, sharpening pencils, filling the glue pot, everything in short but writing about sports. When the Observer's editor saw Frankie at the dead kid's desk, he quite reasonably asked him what he was doing there. Frankie responded that Mr. Garrick had given him the job. The editor asked Mr. Garrick if this was the case. Garrick said it was not. The editor told Frank Garrick to let Sinatra go. More likely, with what one knows of editors and the time and the territory, he told him to let the lying little son of a bitch go. Garrick regretfully informed his godson that he, Frankie, had put him in an untenable position and that it would be impossible for him, Frankie, to stay in the Observer's employ. Whereupon, Frankie lost it. Screaming, red-faced, veins pounding, he cursed out his godfather, dredging up every scrap of gutter talk he'd learned on the sidewalks of Hoboken a 16-year-old high school dropout cursing out a grown man, a figure of benevolence and authority, the man who had given him his name. Like Dolly, he resented authority in any guise, especially when he knew he was wrong, Sinatra's daughter Tina wrote. The more you yanked him by the neck, the less he liked it, and the more he'd dig in his heels. The Garrick episode has a whiff of sulfur about it. It speaks of the old world spirit, the true, violent spirit of Vendetta. But even worse, if true, and there's no reason to suppose it isn't, since both Garrick and, later, his widow recalled the incident, it says not so good things about the teenage Sinatra. Does this make him a tougher customer than we first suspected? Probably not. For all Sinatra's claims that he'd run with a rough crowd, carried around a length of lead pipe, and so on, not to mention his stories about Marty teaching him to fight, there are too many accounts from Hoboken contemporaries that portray him as a natty little weakling who couldn't punch his way out of a paper bag, who tried desperately to bribe bigger, tougher boys to be his friends. An old photograph in Nancy Sinatra's second book about her father, Frank Sinatra, an American legend, shows Frankie, aged about 12, looking rather timid as he stands on the sidewalk with his big, expensive bicycle. He's wearing a newsboy cap, beautifully pressed trousers, and a jacket marked Turks. Frank sporting the t-shirt of his street gang, the Turks, Ms. S's caption reads. 